Greetings everyone and welcome to the channel. I'm your host, Hadron. Today we kick off the saga of the Caesars with the man who started it all. After having been well positioned by his adoptive father, Octavian would go on to greatly surpass his namesake, laying the foundation for the Principate and the beginning of the Pax Romana or the Roman Peace. Nowhere near Julius Caesar's equal on the battlefield, he was much more than a match for him in another arena, the political variety. Without further delay, let's get into this week's episode. There are many famous quotes from Caesar's death. Et tu, Brute? are the words that Shakespeare inserted as the dying dictator's final moments. Another famous quote shouted over his dead corpse was Sic Semper Tyrannus, or Thus Always to Tyrants. Whatever was said, the greatest Roman who ever lived now lay dead on the floor of the Senate, and the fallout from his death was a pressure cooker set to explode. To understand the Roman world's reaction to Caesar's death, we need to explore the atmosphere of the time. It's easy to assign the modern idea of freedom from tyranny being the reaction to Caesar's death. However, this is simply not the case at all. The Roman Republic was an oligarchy, the rule of an elite class of people over the population at large. For centuries, a battle had waged with considerable social upheaval between the more conservative elements of the Republic and the reformers seeking to change the system from within. Over the preceding decades, many men rose to champion the cause of the people at large. While their reasoning for, quote-unquote, pandering to the mob, as the Senate would see it, may have been noble and just, or maybe it was just their ticket to power and wealth, we cannot say. What we do know is how the establishment responded. Tiberius Gracchus and then his brother Gaius Gracchus, both eliminated by the Senate. After them, another series of reformers all met the same terrible fate over the following decades. Marius had been fairly successful as a champion of the people, but after his death, the Marian faction had been decimated by Sulla. Caesar had risen from the ashes of that movement and was up to this point the most successful of all the reformers to date. In short, the people and the armies of Rome loved the man. They saw him as their champion, fighting for their interests. And the Senate had just murdered him. These liberators, as they became known, had been the very men who Caesar had pardoned after defeating them in the battles during the Civil War. In their zeal to restore the Mos Maiorum, or the social norms of Rome, and likely their own power and control in the process, they had indeed liberated the Republic, out of existence. Gaius Octavius Thurinus was born to his father Gaius Octavius and mother Atia on September the 23rd, 63 BC. His mother Atia was the niece of Julius Caesar by way of Caesar's sister Julia Minor. In the year 59 BC, at the age of four, his father would die, leaving Atia to remarry and for the young Octavian to be raised by his grandmother Julia for his formative years. After Julia's death, his mother and father began to take a more active role in his upbringing. At the age of 16, he donned the toga virilis, signifying his manhood. After, in 47 BC, he was elected to the College of Pontiffs. It was, however, in the year 46 BC that his life began to change forever. His great uncle, Julius Caesar, was neck deep in the civil war against the Pompeian faction. Initially, he wanted to sail to Africa to aid Caesar, but was forced to delay by his mother. Eventually, he set sail for Spain before becoming shipwrecked en route. Making landfall with his comrades, he traversed hostile territory to reunite with Caesar and his forces. Caesar was greatly impressed by the courage and fortitude of his young great-nephew, and from that point forward, the two men grew very close, even sharing a carriage together as they traveled. Caesar had no legitimate sons. In the patriarchal world of Rome, this was a considerable issue. His only daughter, Julia, had died in childbirth years before. His only other issue, a possible son named Caesarian, the child of Cleopatra, was illegitimate, and also the child of a foreign sovereign. Thus, Caesar, upon his return to Rome, deposited a new will with the Vestal Virgins. The explosive contents of this will became public upon the assassination of Caesar on the 15th of March, 44 BC. Mark Antony had been one of the consuls for that year. It had been a huge blunder on the part of the assassins not to eliminate him at the same time as Caesar. One of the dictator's closest friends, he was a natural rallying point for the now disenfranchised Caesarian loyalists. An uneasy truce settled between Antony and the liberators. During Caesar's funeral, Antony had driven many of the assassins from the city with fiery rhetoric. 
Octavian returned to Rome shortly afterwards from his military training. After the reading of Caesar's will, the knowledge that Octavian had been adopted by his great uncle as his son became known, as too did his inherited estate from the late dictator. Anthony and Octavian quickly became rivals in the widening power vacuum. Nearing the end of his consular year, Antony secured himself the governorship of Cisalpine Gaul. Octavian had begun building his own private army, and feeling threatened, Antony left for his post and the protection of the troops it would provide for him. The only problem was the province had already been assigned by the Senate, to Decimus Brutus, one of Caesar's chief assassins, and he was not willing to step aside and no matter how much Antony insisted. Antony took whatever forces he could muster to dislodge Brutus from his position and headed to confront him. The Senate, keen to stop Antony and end the violence, looked to Octavian and his forces, as at present, they fielded no troops of their own. Octavian, after failing to secure the consulship for himself, united with the two consuls and headed north to confront Antony and relieve his siege at Mutina of Brutus and his forces. At the Battle of Forum Galorum, and then afterwards at Mutina, Antony was defeated and both consuls were subsequently killed, leaving Octavian with sole command of his army once more. The Senate was elated at the news of the victory, celebrating Brutus while marginalizing Octavian. Then they attempted to give the same command to the armies of Brutus, Octavian, unimpressed, elected to remain in the Po Valley and withdraw his support in the pursuit of the now public enemy, Antony. He sent a delegation to the Senate, asking for the now vacant consulship to be bestowed upon him, which was refused. He then marched to Rome with his eight legions and asked to be made consul once more from just outside the city. Obviously, the terrified Senate caved and they gave him the prize he sought. Antony, now desperate, formed an alliance with Marcus Lepidus, another leading Caesarian. Upon learning of the formation of a huge liberator army in the east, Octavian met with the other two men near Bologna in 43 BC, in October. It was here that the Second Triumvirate was formed. Octavian, Antony, Lepidus then began a series of bloody prescriptions ordering the deaths of many of their rivals and wealthy members of the state. In this bloodbath, the great orator Cicero finally met his end. Marching to Greece, the combined Caesarian army confronted the Liberator army and in two battles they defeated the last of the Liberators, claiming the ascendancy of the Caesarian faction. Antony cemented his reputation as a great military leader at the Battle of Philippi, while Octavian established a reputation as a coward, spending most of his time ill and away from the battle. Instead, Marcus Agrippa, Octavian's best friend and right hand, had done most of the fighting for him. With this victory, a state of relative peace descended across the empire. Three regions were established. Anthony took command of the east, focusing mostly on Egypt. Octavian was given Gaul and Spain. Lepidus took the lead in North Africa. Italia was to be neutral territory for all three men. Octavian was tasked with the impossible job of settling the veterans of the various Caesarian wars. He was left to pay the bill, and the money to do so was lacking to say the least. This made him incredibly unpopular as he was forced to use terrible means to acquire the lands and the funds that he needed. This horrible tension gave rise to the uprising in Italia instigated by Anthony's brother Lucius Antonius and Anthony's wife Fulvia. Octavian ultimately put down this rebellion with brutal resolve, only sparing Anthony's brother and his wife. The bloody crushing of this revolt shattered Octavian's reputation at home and spurred Anthony to head to Italia with a large army to attack and remove Octavian. Both armies refused to fight, however, and this ultimately ended up resulting in a new settlement between the two rivals with the marriage of Anthony to Octavian's sister, Octavia. Compounding his problems was the son of Pompey, Sextus Pompeius, who set up on the island of Sicily and began to strangle food and trade coming into Italia through piracy. After several failed attempts to crush Sextus, Octavian, and by Octavian I mean mostly Agrippa, eventually defeated Sextus and his navy, seizing the island with the aid of ships from Antony and forces from Lepidus. Antony had lent Octavian 120 ships for the promised aid of 20,000 men to help him fight the Parthians in the east in his upcoming campaign. He eventually sent a paltry 2,000 to his supposed colleague, furthering the rift between the two men. Lepidus, who had aided Octavian and Agrippa in the campaign, overplayed his hand, trying to increase his position in the Triumvirate by seizing Sicily for his own sphere of influence. Octavian simply forced him out of the Triumvirate, taking his land and increasing his own power greatly, 
as Lepidus' troops abandoned him. In 38 BC, Octavian divorced his wife Scribonia and married Livia, who would be by his side for the rest of his life. This brought her young son Tiberius into the family from this point forwards. Now, all that remained was Octavian and Antony, who ruled the Roman world. Residing in Egypt and living with as well as fathering several children with Cleopatra, Antony launched a disastrous campaign against Parthia, greatly weakening his political position at home. Antony also sent Octavia back to Rome, which upset the balance of power even further. Octavian used this insult, along with the defeat, to begin to spread the propaganda of Antony. He painted him as too Eastern, corrupted by the influence of Cleopatra, too authoritarian. Antony's actions did not help him, as he did several things which aided Octavian in painting this picture of him. In 32 BC, a defector informed Octavian of the private contents of Antony's will, now housed with the Vestal Virgins. Forcibly entering the temple, he extracted the will and read its contents to the shocked and stunned Senate. In the donations of Alexandria, Antony left large portions of the Roman world to Cleopatra's children, a huge affront to the Senate and the Roman people. This was the final straw, and the Roman people and the Senate abandoned Antony, declaring war on Egypt. In the naval showdown at Actium on September 2, 31 BC, Octavian and Agrippa defeated the forces of Antony and Cleopatra, pursuing their prey to Alexandria to deliver the killing blow. Antony took his own life upon learning that Cleopatra had died, she had in fact not done so, and fell into Octavian's custody. She then elected to avoid the mockery and strangulation at a triumph, taking her own life instead. Octavian was now the sole master of Rome. Stay tuned next week as we explore the foundation of the Empire through the death of Augustus, the establishment of the Principate, and the struggle to find an heir to his empire and legacy. If you enjoyed this episode, please click the subscription, like, and notification buttons. Also, please follow me on Twitter, at HadronTV, to be kept in the loop for future content. Thanks for watching.